Welcome, Andy. Thank you so much for joining uh, us on our. Just for the people listening, Andy's from um, from Improvata, right? Yeah. Now I'm going to get your title correct: Senior Product Marketing Manager for your the global solution. Yes, that's and Improvata. Correct. You're all about identity frameworks. That's right, and identity is our business for sure. Yeah. Thank you for coming. And you had to stay over in the lovely Cheltenham in order to be I, here in the I morning. So did. It's a beautiful town. I love visiting Cheltenham. Yeah. I like the fact that we can be face to face as well. It's it's nice after a, a two years of doing things virtually. Yes, definitely. So the reason why we're doing this conversation yeah. is you sent me something that Improvata have, which is an Improvata um, digital identity framework. And to me, when I looked at it, and we're not going to go through all of the boxes, I was Thank like, you. oh, this is a really good, yeah, that would be a dull, <laughs> that would dull be a conversation. Yes, it would be. <laughs> But it's very thorough. And I yeah. thought, you know what, well, actually, it is very useful for people to be able mm. to see why digital identity is really important. Yeah. And I suppose in short, it's just, we're always online. Yeah. We've got all of this footprints. And if you can't tie it back to an individual or a business, yeah. then how on earth are you going to secure it? Is yeah. that essentially it? Essentially, yeah. I mean, you know, as we've, we've put more and more of our individual lives, our commercial lives online into the cloud, so the, the, the fundamental importance of digital identity has, has only become greater and greater. And we've moved so far from the need for just a username and password, um, and that was it, that's all we needed to log on to, to, to needing to think much more carefully about um, the data that we store, the information that we put online and how we protect that and how we use identity to control access to that. Yeah. Especially as we move into this world of zero trust and, and that need to to adopt those kind of um, approaches to protecting data. Yeah, you can't do zero trust if you don't know whether you're trust, who you trust it. Exactly, right? so, yeah, you need yeah. to know who someone is. So today we'll talk yeah. about a bit more about why it's important, a bit yeah. about you as well. Um, yeah. And then I like to have tangible examples. Oh, I do too. Yeah, because <laughs> otherwise it's just waffle. Absolutely. So um, as a, com a company together, Improvata yeah. and Summerford, yeah. um, we, we resell uh, Improvata yeah. and, and we're partnered with um, a few of our customers. Yeah. Um, so we'll go through those examples yeah. and then you have a particular example which uses the whole suite of yes. Improvata. That's correct. Yeah. So that would be good and yeah. we can make parallels with other sectors. Yeah. Yes. And then in, for other people listening, if they, we don't have to plug Improvata here, but if they want to know more about identity frameworks and where they sit on a yeah. maturity module of that, yeah. you know, where can they go to next and yeah. what do they need to think of? So we'll do that at the end. Yes. Right, let's start with you then, Andy. Yes. <laughs> how come? How did you end up here talking about identity? How did I end up here? Well, it's an interesting journey. Well, it's not. It's interesting to me. I mean, I I left university after studying electronic and like uh, electrical and electronic engineering. Did some help desk work at um, a major retail chain in the UK, who you know Dixon Stores Group, and then moved onto the corporate world, doing um, working for a corporate internet service provider down in Cambridge for several years before I, I, I kind of moved into healthcare um, a little bit by accident. Um, a friend of mine from when I was at the corporate ISP was working for a small startup in healthcare. So I, he said, do you want a job? And I said, sure, why not? Why not? Um, and, and that kind of moved me into the healthcare space. And, and I kind of did a, a range of roles there ranging, you know, from product management, business development around, a, a, you know, a broad range of, small businesses, you know, large PLCs, before ending up about, I think, six years ago, near enough now, in Pravata. Because um, Improvata's big in healthcare, isn't it? Improvata's huge in healthcare. Mm. I mean, you know, for, for many years we were, or, you know, for want of a better description, exclusive in healthcare. Um, that's that's evolved a little bit over maybe the last five or six years. Mm. And, and, and part of that is tied, I think, to that, you know, evolution of the use of digital identity is that we can see that, that more and more is moving into the electronic space. We're doing more and more online. And, and actually what we've done as a business is more and more um, valid in a broader range of industries than just healthcare. And I yeah. think that's why, why it's really interesting and exciting to talk about that today. Yeah, because our our clients that we have are yeah. not healthcare even. No. So they're, they're like the perfect niche for you to yeah. show. Yeah. Um, but the... Key thing with Improvata, as I understand it, it's not like um, just cloud identity. You can do you can do that, but you, you 
can also do the kind of the really old school. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what we would call, I mean, old school is actually a really good term for it because a lot of it is old school. And, and we think back to, um, you know, when we all used to sit there and get the, the CD-ROM or the, the floppy disks and install thick client applications. And there's a lot of them still out, you know, out there, a lot of terminal programs still. And they'll never change those ones, like not in It will there. take a long time because a lot of it is cost driven as mm. well. I mean, as a business, you invest in technology platforms. You know, some of them are fairly small and fairly cheap. Others are, are vast hundreds and millions of dollars or, or pounds worth of um, cost to implement. And it takes time to change that. So, mm. You know, as a, a improvator, as a business, is very, focused very much on the fact that, that we don't all just use cloud-based applications with, um, you know, web-based standards-based single sign-on. That there are thick client applications with their own identity stores, or you know, we were talking earlier about like um, things like terminal applications, like AS four hundred solutions that are, are really old but still have usernames and passwords to access them. And and as a business, you need to be able to provide seamless access to all of these systems for all of your users. And a, you know, a pure cloud-based single sign-on solution is never going to deliver that to you. Mm. In, and that's where I think Improvata's strength has always been and, and will continue to be, is that ability to provide universal functions to, to the users in terms of that access management irrespective of what platforms and, and applications they're using. Yeah. So let's, I think we've talked about enough why it's important to have digital yeah. identity. Zero trust. Uh, do you need so. identity? It's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we are, we're in, aside from the growth in use of technology platforms, I think the other thing maybe just to call out at this point is the growth in legislation and regulation okay, yeah. that sits around um, data. So we're talking GDPR. Mm -hmm. Uh, you see cybersecurity directives, um, you know, the EU implemented NIS and now NIS2, which we, you know, uh, individual org nations implementing their own laws. But it governs um, how we access, you know, how, what, what, are, what we should be doing to protect data, to protect access to the systems. And, you know, interestingly, we saw NIS, uh, um, the U EU NIS directive, which came in, I think, maybe 2018, something like that. The, they've iterated on that in uh, NIS 2. Now, originally, the, there was a fairly narrow description of what they call critical infrastructure. So that was things like healthcare and power. Yeah. They've actually expanded that now. And I think that's some recognition over things like we, we've become very dependent on things like the internet. Um, you know, electronic services. So there's a broader range of industries now that are a kind of need to ensure that they're implementing a, a base level of security across the whole business to protect the the um, you know the services that they provide. Yeah. So I think that's a game where identity is hugely important, and, and recognizing that there is legislation and regulation that all of us, you know, in the business world need to be cognizant of, mm. and and be meeting those minimum standards. Mm. Is it going to be post-Brexit as well? Are we going to copy across that one? I, I think it's likely that we will implement a lot of it anyway. I mean, we'd already implemented our own um, implementation of NIS already. Okay. So, uh, and we see a lot of you know, what the um, the National Cyber Security Centre bring down in terms of uh, the, you know, their, their guides for what the right level of security is for systems. So I think it, even if we're not aligned to the EU anymore, the fact that we are we will probably be looking to a similar level of security. And it, and it makes sense irrespective of whether we're in the EU yeah. or not. Yeah, it does. Let's go to examples then. Yes, absolutely. Why not? It's so together we have a bank, yep. an insurance yep. base, and a manufacturer, yep. which we think, no, a processor, so of physical yeah. things. They don't yeah. make stuff, they recycle yeah. stuff. So actually, it's a demanufacturer <laughs> of things, um, but very physical world, yes. right? So yeah. those are three good examples that we want to bring yeah, up, excellent. right? Yeah. So let's start with the bank and the insurance space. Yeah. So we're thinking what kind of infrastructure, what kind of architecture do they have? Yeah, so they're going to be, um, yeah. I guess if you look at them, they're going to have a, a, a range of systems that they use. I mean, certainly for anything in the financial world, security is going to be of paramount concern and um, not just security of access, but also that ability to audit mm. and to ensure that everyone is 
is logging in, for want of a better description, um, under their own accounts. There's no account sharing. There's no generic accounts that we've got a really strong, you know, strong door to the systems that we use and then a really strong audit trail of who's doing what, where, when, how and why in the systems. When did they access it? You know, what system did they access once they logged in? And, you know, again, if we think about the level of security they're going to want, they're not going to be having like four or eight digit passwords. They're going to want 16, 24 digit passwords for all of the systems that they use that require passwords that need to be complex. So, you know, um, symbols, uppercase, lowercase, lots of lots of things that are going to present challenges for the the users that need yeah. to use them, and I think that's that's good because there's some very important data that they're protecting. But how do we balance that with a layer of security that's easy to use? Yeah, and so we use one sign for yes. that, yeah. which is just a sort of tap, yeah, one tap. Yeah, you can do it with a tap um, onto a reader. Most organizations now are moving to use that as part of an MFA, so multi-factor mm. authentication approach where you'll use a tap and pin or a tap and pass. Yeah. Some second factor. So for, for those that may not be aware, MFA is something you have and something you know, and then there are other levels of, as well. So something you are is yeah. another example that you can layer on top. Something you are, what do you mean? Like a, your... like a biometric. Yeah, like a fingerprint yes. or something. Yes. Ooh, okay. And then, and then when you're inside, yeah. it has like all the single sign on and everything yeah. like that, even over mainframes and really old yeah. school. So, so that's uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, once you're in, you've got an enterprise level single sign on solution that uh, works across all of the applications. It also allows you as a user to not be tied to one computer. So we see a lot of hot desking. I mean, mm. we've, I've come here to your offices today and there's plenty of hot desks around. Yep. And and people don't always come and sit next to the same computer. They don't always have a laptop that they're carrying everywhere with them. And enterprise SSO means that you can sit wherever you want. You can access from whichever device you want and have access to that same level of, of, of service, for want of a better description, um, for all of the you know the accounts that you need to to use to log on to things, yeah, and it's not holding you back, no. but it's just as secure. Well, this is it, and, and you know we talk about a lot of this in healthcare about wasted time, I and mean, I think the same applies irrespective of it being healthcare or not. Yeah. Is that time you're spent logging into a system or or waiting to access the the tool, the application you want, is time that you're not spent, you know performing your job and yeah. you know I find that frustrating from a personal perspective you know I forget my iCloud password and I'm spending 15 minutes just trying to unlock reset it, it reset it yeah. and you know it's not about necessarily making our workers work for longer and harder but it's actually making work less frustrating mm. and that's a really important point is it, it's you know frustrate it's frustration we're putting barriers and, and frustration so if we can remove some of those and we make people's life easier happier um <laughs> you're in a charity as well no I no i get it though yeah it's it's just you know just, uh, we want people to come and perform well in work so yeah. why do we we make work as frustrating as possible to do no but it's also the frustrations mean people would tend to go around it well, that, and then it's unauditable and and you know, un- That's unsecurable. a really great point. And we see, um, we, we do see a lot of that still. Account sharing is is very common, leaving computers. In fact, I've got a really good example of, um, uh, I just I won't talk about names or no names, no pack, you know. No, no, don't worry. But I was, I was at a, a place and we were talking about how do you secure your workstations when you, you have to go from it and, and do you lock them? And this person said to me, oh, yeah, absolutely. I always lock my workstation. And then I watched them walk away from their workstation and then their idea of locking it was to switch the monitor off. Oh. Which to them is, uh, it's a workaround because they see it as frustrating to, yeah, yeah. To, to go control alt delete enter, go away, then come back and do control alt delete again and type the username and password in. So for them, their workaround was to switch the monitor off and they thought they were locking it. But all someone would have had to do there potentially was to come along, switch the monitor back on, and you've got access to all of the information, data, applications, accounts that that other user has access to. I suppose, like, as you're an engineer, I used to be an engineer too, I did engineering, it seems obvious Yes. To us, but I'm not a nurse or a controlled yeah. doctor or someone who's been highly trained in something else. Yeah, to understand that that isn't locking well, the thing. It's it's not actually. I think as humans, we we have a, a a tendency to want to find the most efficient, yeah. the, the the least disruptive way of doing something, and 
and and some of that is an education in why for example switching the monitor off isn't secure mm-hmm. and and uh, as organizations we we should have an obligation to educate our staff to train our staff in best practices but inevitably you know as you get used to the environment you start to find those shortcuts those workarounds those mm-hmm. things just to to make make life a bit easier it is accentuated you're absolutely right it is very much accentuated in the clinical world mm-hmm. because a lot of the time you're dealing with life and death situations but i think in general that that path of least resistance that's the right term yeah. it is a human nature yeah. thing well, the other example we have in terms of clients that we wanted to bring up with the, the unmanufacturing mm. un- place um, is, is where we have uh, an opportunity not just to use um, one sign, yeah. but also to use all of the Improvata's mobile stuff, which mm-hmm. is very similar. It's sharing devices yeah. because it's cheaper to share devices and to, to use that side of things. That, that's a, another area, isn't it, that we're, yeah. you can help with? Yeah, absolutely. And and. Yeah, we're seeing a natural evolution from Windows desktops, that that classic thick client um, solution that we've seen for many years, to delivering services or delivering functionality to our workers on a mobile device, mm. and and it makes sense in certain um, certain places. I mean, you see it when you go into a shop in retail. Yeah, a lot of them have these POS um, devices now, which are mobile. Um, whichever manufacturer someone chooses to to dip into, but. It's not feasible for us to provide every member of staff with their own personal device or even, you know, have a large number of devices for the number of staff you have on at a particular time mm. or whatever your your kind of environment is. So we shared devices are natural there. It, it's a logical um, thing to do. But then thinking about we talked about security, number one, we want to provide, um, you know, we want to lock the door to what – to the device because we don't want anyone to just pick it up and you know imagine a pharmacy for example where mm. you've got a device there which has people's prescriptions on that's particularly insecure you know a lot, I, I mean I go into retail um you know go shopping with my wife and you see there that when they're on their device they can see your own like like store account mm. so they can see what you're spending what you know they can start to build people can build a picture of you your life yeah, there's um, a lot of identity in there there's a lot of um, identifiable data, or even as a business. I, I mean, you think that you know, it could be lists of customers, uh, lists of uh, you know sales. Yeah, there's a huge amount of data and, and information that's available. So we want to lock it. That, that was where I was trying to get to with that. Yeah. And because we're moving to mobile, we need to try and provide that same level of security that's quick and easy but secure. Mm. So uh, yeah, we can do that with um, a mobile device. We can take that same uh, card. Um, badge tap and a lot you know we all have like door access cards so they're they're a really natural thing to use because we tend to be quite protective over them or or actually more things like canteen cards Mm. people you know anything (laughs) that allows them to buy coffee and food they're going to be very protective over but it's a great thing to use as an access tool because of that take that tap on and then provide that same single sign-on functionality to your mobile based applications And I get. I mentioned it earlier because we're an enterprise level solution. That um, you know, it's not like you have one set of SSO, so a single sign-on for the mobile solution, and one for your desktop. It's all together, together yeah. in a single solution, so you can seamlessly transfer from you know working on a, a Windows-based computer to a, an Android-based mobile mm. to, to back again. And it's you know that's a natural evolution of how we use digital technology yeah. in the workplace. And then devices, right? Because yeah. you're talking about mobiles and tablets yeah. and tills and whatever. Yeah. Um, but you can also talk about, well, in healthcare, there's I don't know, medical machinery and scanning yeah. equipment, or in manufacturing, there's machinery that is doing the manufacturing yeah. or ordering and supply yeah. chain um, work. Yeah. All of that can be kind of one signed as well, right? Or it, it, it certainly, it certainly can. I mean, we've we've done we've made great strides in this in the clinical world with, uh, as you say, those connected um, devices, uh, vital signs monitors, um, scales. There's a good example: De- um, connected scales, uh, and it, it makes sense again to get to have that audit trail of who's using the device, mm. and certainly. You know, depending on what the device is running, we can we can manage the access to that as well, and it makes sense. And, and 
a lot of these devices are becoming connected as well. So they're not, they don't live in isolation. They, they have their own, you know, they're connected to the internet. And that actually brings us on to an interesting point around, um, you know, these connected devices when we want service on them. Some of them, you know, you might require the vendor to connect into the system to, to, to perform service or maintenance. And we have solutions that can deal with that. So this is starting to get into the territory of what we call privileged access management. Yes. So where you want to talk, to allow someone to have access temporarily to one of your systems. And if that's external, that's what we call vendor privileged access yeah. management. So someone external to the business who doesn't have their own you know, internal AD account. Well, it or, should all be temporary anyway. Can you rotate? Be these secrets and things. Well, yeah, well. that's yeah. exactly what our solution is meant yeah. to do, is to temporarily enable an account with a password, allow the vendor to access whatever we grant them access to, and also audit what they do when mm. they access as well. Yeah. So that's a really critical part of privileged access management, is being able to audit the actions, because it's all right granting someone access to what, you know our, our system, you know, to, to you know, administrator access, let's say, to our systems, but we also want to be able to see what they do because yeah. we want to make sure they, they don't do anything bad. So all of this is really critical uh, you know, to managing how we control access to what we do as, as organisations, as businesses. Great. So we've gone through our bank, yes. insurance and manufacturing. Yeah. Let's let's talk about someone you know, yeah. like client you know, who's using like the whole of digital yeah. identity. It's like really mature in that. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to talk about an NHS organization. Mm -hmm. um, they're probably one of our um, you know, most important customers in terms of, as you say, consuming all of our products, all of our uh, or the majority of our products, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, and using them really effectively. And when we start to think uh, you know, we've talked a lot in the in the past you know, 30 minutes or so about Access and that I think is where everyone, everyone's mind naturally goes to when you think about identity. It's usernames and passwords. It's it's logging into systems yes. and applications. But actually, when you take a step back, identity starts. You know, even from the moment you put a job advert out, mm. and you start to recruit people, sending CVs, so you're gathering people's data. And okay. but but all of this forms what we call the join and move a lever process. Yeah, I see. So. The NHS organisation I'm talking about have implemented our identity governance solution. And what that does is automate um, through a range of different tools, RPAs, um, the process of enabling someone to, to start work. So taking a, a feed from a HR solution, mm -hmm. something like ServiceNow, um, um, different, you know, even a CSV file if you want, mm -hmm. if that's the way you're managing your onboarding. But being able then to provision their Active Directory, their email, then all of those applications, both um, thick client, uh, cloud-based, whatever you're using, we can we can use RPA tools to provision into all those systems. So, and and this can be done in in seconds. Yeah. So this NHS organisation had an onboarding process that was driven by paper mm -hmm. so I you know, I would start I would have a piece of paper with a bunch of tick boxes on yeah. and I would have to go around to each department and, and yeah, so I, could, I can see the pain and already in my like face two weeks that was taking and you wow. imagine from a you know junior doctor or a doctor's perspective two weeks just to get access to the computer systems that I want to use to yeah. Yeah. to um to do my job so but we implemented our identity governance and reduced that down to a matter of seconds, right. 25 seconds. And is it based by role? You can distinguish the access by role, yes. presumably. So that's a very critical point mm. per Point about identity governance is it's role it, it's role based. So mm -hmm. you define roles in advance and you can then map people as they come into different roles. Mm. Um, that deals with the onboarding side of things. It also manages what we call, you know, the life cycle piece. Yeah, so moving. the moving around. Yeah. And, and one thing that you can see, uh, and it, it's very common, is what we call um, permission inheritance uh, or, or permission creep. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've I'm Andy. I've been, um, you know, given this set of permissions as a baseline. But then I've I've asked for whatever reason. I've I've had some more permissions added to my, um, you know, Active Directory group or Active Directory accounts. And then someone else joins in who's got the same position as me, mm. and someone go, and they go, okay, right, we'll copy Andy's permissions. I see. Yeah. But they've 
copied my baseline permissions, but they've inherited the additional ones I've been added. And that's a, which might have been for a special product or exactly. Like, yeah, okay. So what happens over time is that then that next person's account gets copied mm. with some extra permissions that they've been granted, and you get this creep. Yeah. So identity governance is designed to prevent that happening by managing the moving and removing permissions that aren't needed anymore, adding permissions that aren't are needed, changing groups, and also a clear out. A clear out. Absolutely. Is it very visible as well? Is it very visual? Yeah. So it has a whole set of um, dashboard reports yeah. where you can manage, uh, you know, permissions, applications you have access to. Yeah. You can look at it from an application perspective. The other great thing is it can manage multiple identity stores. So oh. if you've got more than just ID, uh, Active Directory, if you have an application that has its own pool of usernames and passwords yeah. separate from your core um, Active Directory, it can manage those as well and, and know that it's created an account in there so that when it's when that I leave the business, for example, it can it remembers to take that off. It can automatically yeah. decommission. Yeah. So this NHS organization are using that to provision into Active Directory, into email, into their electronic medical records, yeah. um, all of their other associated clinical systems immediately, and then manage that life cycle. And the decommissioning. And decommissioning is an, an interesting one because I think what sometimes businesses don't really realise is that all of those user accounts are also consuming okay. licences. And yeah. one thing we've seen is, and we they did an audit at this NHS org, that, that they were consuming, over-consuming Microsoft licences, which when you're paying, I don't, I don't know how much an, an E3 or an E5 license is these days, but... You know, you are consuming, you're paying money for licenses that you may well not need. Yeah. So actually automating that offboarding mm. process and removing licenses to any of the applications that you're paying per user for is going to have a very positive effect on your, you know, your bottom line, yeah, <laughs> which brilliant. is a great thing. And then yeah, we would talk to, I mean, they're, they're, they're extensive users of single sign-on and yeah. access management, about 8,000 users. They have mobile as well. So mobile is actually a really interesting um, little point just to talk about there because what they wanted to do was roll out an e-observation project. So being able to do observations by the bedside on mobile devices. That's um, yeah. Samsung, I think there were Samsung tablets. But the nurses refused to do it because they had to log in to each system manually. And we all know what those keyboards on. Yeah. You see. And it just held them up. Yeah. And it's, you know, being a shared mobile device, you can't have like I have keychain on my iPhone or, yeah. or something like that, but they can't have that on a shared device. Yeah. So that presented a barrier. And the nurses actually said, no, yeah. not not interested in doing this because it's actually harder to do than using paper. Yeah. You know, it's much easier to, to take a paper and a pen and write things down. Yeah. As bad as that sounds from a data protection and, and, and transcribing perspective. So then they looked at our mobile solution and went, that's the answer because our nurses now, or in fact, the nurse said, great, we can tap on, yep. log in to the device. Mm -hmm. The device is properly secured from the front door so no one can pick it up and mm -hmm. start scrolling through, you know, uh, no. person identifiable we'll pick up data. Paper to do that now. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's a, so they've embraced us, you know, it, holistically across the whole organization, across a range of different um, really products and solutions. And the whole goal is to make things seamless for the end users and to ensure that identity is managed in a very structured, unified manager manner across the whole organisation. Yeah. So there are loads of parallels with other yeah. industries there. Of course. The only difference I see um, that hospitals have a... NHS has a luxury on, apart from perhaps community care, is that it's location-based. Mm. And some security, you might want to... Um, tailor by yeah. you know where you're logging in from yeah. so like i went i've just come back from holiday yeah. if i was um if i was using Bravage and i log in usually in the yeah. uk in my usual setting with my usual secure wi-fi i'd yeah. get access to everything yeah but perhaps when i'm over in um i don't know where i was i was in france on a public nice. wi-fi maybe you can kind of can you tailor it down to say if you're trying to log in there, it's not really actually as secure so i'm not so, going to do everything so that's the next evolution i think of of Digital identity management, that's location-based yeah. access. Um, I think that, I mean, there are various things you can do there immediately, like you can implement um, like push, no, like push MFA, that's the word I'm looking for, multi-factor authentication. So yeah. you can put 
um, a gate on the front of your VPN access. You can force VPN um, if you're on certain networks mm -hmm. and then use Improvata to control the access again through you know, a unified um, identity store that you're using to manage username and password and then the MFA needed to do that. I think for us, the location-based access is, you know, an evolution yeah. that we're, you know, we're looking at. Great. Yeah. So, if we're listening in here, we've yeah. we've seen that you can you can use um, Improvata to help with your digital identity, um, not just for the access, yeah. also single sign all around, and also for multiple devices, mm -hmm. soon to be multiple locations. Yeah. What where? where where should people go to work out where they are on that kind of maturity journey from that, that hospital that you talked about, yeah. which had all of it, to some people who might only have parts of it, where they are? How, how should people assess? So it's a good, good opportunity to talk about um, you know, the, the framework we launched two years ago. And in that interim, we've been working with a variety of organizations and internally to, to look at um, two things. First of all, a maturity model. Mm -hmm. So being able to define, in effect, what good looks like and yeah. what the journey to good looks like. And then as a, in parallel to that, an assessment that allows an organization to evaluate where they are and then to prioritize where they want, what they want to address next. And and I think there's there's two elements to that that kind of assessment piece. Number one is being able to um, kind of decide what the strategy is, but then it's being able to communicate it to the relevant stakeholders internally. Mm. Why is it important that we address that join and move a lever process? Mm. You know, maybe we have got a glut, you know glut of licenses that are, that are being used unnecessarily, and we don't aren't able to manage. Or maybe it does take two weeks from someone joining before they're actually ready to be productive. So, or you know, or do we have an issue with like privileged access management at the moment? Do we just have the administrator username and password in a secret book that's in the safe? Should we be implementing a proper PAM solution, yeah. privileged access management solution that controls access to all of our you know business critical our critical infrastructure? Um, for um, you know administrative purposes, for management purposes, but irrespective of what that is, it, it's about evaluating you know evaluating where we are on the maturity model in different areas, mm -hmm. evaluating where we think as a business the next logical step to go is, mm -hmm. and then communicating that internally and determining what solutions we could we implement. Yeah. And some of it's more than just solutions, it's solutions and processes. Oh, yeah, probably almost entirely. Yes. Everything's solution, yeah. people, process Absolutely. to make it actually happen. Yeah, so there's, um, so you in Bravada have that on yes, your website. Yes, we do. So, and yeah. it's not just for healthcare, it's also for other, it's soon no, to be we have, for all of them. Yeah, absolutely. We have two thing. versions because healthcare, I think, has some unique um, healthcare specific needs. And words, I suppose. And words. Like customers terms, and patients. And yes, this. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So there is a healthcare and one explicitly developed mm. um, for non-healthcare based on our, you know, the, the customers that we've talked about earlier that we work with yeah. in the non-healthcare space. Yeah. So essentially, um, don't have to attach yourself to Improvata, but you can use that assessment to work out where you are. And sorry, because I'm so, but okay. I don't have to make it. Well, it's, obviously, yeah. you have a bias there, but no, yeah. it, but that does give you like a, where are my gaps? Yeah. How am I going to prioritize yeah. fixing those gaps? Or do I want to yet? Where should we go? Well, yeah. I mean, of course, I'm going to be slightly biased in saying that we can fill all the gaps as Improvata, but cool. I think as a, as a, as a business, it's important to, I think number one to embrace the fact that identity should is is critical to the way we 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 operate as businesses and that we need to look at it in a more unified manner across the whole organization and all the touch points yeah. that it has across the organization. So and then to assess where we are and how we can be better. And, and some of that is aligning to those you know, we talked earlier about the regular legislation and legislation, yeah. making sure that we are securing you know all of the you know whether it's customer data that that is protected or whether it's you know our business critical systems that are, are vital to us you know performing as a business you know, assessing it all and then deciding what the next steps are on that journey and and i think it, you know, the journey 
is long. You know, it's it's not something that you're going to be able to flick a switch and just do tomorrow. But it's it's understanding where you are now and, and yeah. you know and where your risks are now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, risk. I mean, risk is actually a really good word to use there. I think mm. it's it's assessing risk and prioritizing um, where we, we you know, what's the right risk to address first. Yeah. So if anyone's listening or watching. Indeed. <laughs> You've got cameras on it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> they can come to, to you, Andy. So was, Andy Wilcox on LinkedIn. And yes, Andy Wilcox. Um, I think it's Andy Wilcox 01 on LinkedIn. 01, uh, okay. Uh, for some reason. And you can go to the Improvato one. And Summerford, we can help there as well. because Of course, yeah. We can kind of, um, we, we have a business value consulting kind of arm yeah. Yeah. and can help guide through yeah. where you're at, um, how you might want to implement in some identity yeah. solution so yeah, yeah i mean you know we've, we've worked very closely with you in the, in the past and, and been very successful and, and you know aside from myself within improvata there's my colleague tony jackson who works you know works with you very closely who mm -hmm. can also help as well so either of us at improvata would be happy to, yeah. to have a conversation yeah. yeah no but there's got so much that um one needs to think about yeah and uh you can help with. I mean, the one thing I would say is, it, it, I mean, we've made it sound quite scary, but it shouldn't be and it isn't. But it, it's about having, you know, that vision to say, I recognise, not improvata, I recognise identity is, you know, I think Microsoft, do, uh, what did Microsoft define it as? Um, the, the new control plane in, okay. in how we operate. And I think that's a really important takeaway is that identity is critical to how we run our businesses these days. Yeah. And and don't be scared by it, but embrace it and embrace looking at it in a very unified manner. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much for coming in to discuss all That's that. It's a pleasure to be here. And, Thank you. Um, yes, I hope everyone got something from it. I yeah. certainly found it interesting. You get very enthusiastic when you I talk do. about identity. I do. I and think... digital identity. It's got so many doors. It, it is. Well, I just like to say thank you for anyone that's listened um, to be drone on for an hour <laughs> or so about all. identity. <laughs> not an hour. Um, I'm sure it's not an hour. <laughs> we, we in Pride are very passionate about yeah, identity and, and we think it's hugely important. So, yeah, no, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Right. Take care.